All right, freaks and freakettes, it's time. This is the time that you've been waiting for. You've been waiting all week for this, haven't you? Yes, you have. You know you know, you have. So it's time for Student of the Gun Radio. We're into the 1200s now. Episode 1201. Very cool. We're going to talk. We're going to do an after action of the first ever Student of the Gun University Advanced Precision Rifle. Or if you really want to go long, which we always do, right? We always want to go long. It's the Advanced Hepper. The A H E P R, the A H E P R. Isn't that the not the just along? not just the H E P R, the A H E P R. Yeah. Like, dude, stop, stop! You're freaking, you're messing with me. Okay, I'll stop messing with you. Uh, we're gonna do uh, some after action, some product reviews. Jared's gonna give us. Jared's gonna give us his review of the MPO rifle scope, and uh, we've got another. It's like I don't believe it, Paul, because. Uh, what was that colossal douchebag? Uh, Mr. Pogue. How can I forget? Mr. Pogue. Mr. Pogue said, you're more likely to shoot yourself with your own gun than you are to ever need it to defend yourself against a wild animal. I don't know if Mr. Pogue's paying attention to this, but we had another bear home invasion. And uh, that's all coming up today on the super cool, fantastical, soon to be award winning. Student of the Gun Radio. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics. Because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drip ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping ogre, Zach Martin. Now, give it up for your beloved host, the Pin Hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. All righty. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I've got my coffee in my official Paul Markle mug. That's that's how I know it's mine because it has my name on it. Otherwise, I wouldn't know. Mm. Ah, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So I hope that the, that that the that the storm season has passed a little bit here. Holy crap! It, it's it it's here, been that's for sure. It's been raining here like crazy. When I got back from the class the other night. There was standing water in the driveway. Uh, There was puddles. Um, And it's messing with my ladies. The freaking chickens don't like thunderstorms and hailstorms and stuff like that. It it bunges them up. Hailstorm was a good mid-2000s band, though. Really? Yes. I went through a pretty hardcore hailstorm on the way back. Hailstorm phase. Yeah. Yeah. So, any hooser. So, any hooser, uh, if you guys, oh, if you have questions, we have answers. Go ahead and post them in the uh, the Discord channel. If you're not on the Student of the Gun Discord channel, it's really difficult to get there. You go to studentofthegun.com slash Discord, and you can get in there. And you can chitter chat back and forth with your friends and, and like-minded individuals. And you can watch this show live as it's being produced. Uh, right now, we are live. Uh, and if you're listening to this later, fantastic. Listen to it later. All right. What we did uh, the last two weekends in a row, we had we did a lot of rifle shooting. Well, I didn't do a lot of rifle shooting. I did a lot of talking and watching and coaching and observing. But the people who showed up did a lot of rifle shooting. And we're going to talk about that. Actually, uh, our our friend Dan Zimmerman over at the Truth About Guns uh, he went. He published a review called "Going Long: uh, Improving Your Skills at High Elevation at a High Elevation Precision Rifle Course." Yes, indeed. And the link to that, if you'd like to read all about it, if you'd like to read all about it, well, you can uh, because the link is in the show notes. Now, something that we need to clarify, Jared and Zach. Well, not Zach. Maybe. Well, maybe Zach. Uh, is that this is not a match competition class. I I believe that there may be some people out there in the audience who are like, well, you know, I've seen those guys at the range, those long range guys, and they all have $5,000 rifles and, and they, and the rifles weigh like 20 pounds and, and they're red and blue and green. And they're got stickers on them like race cars and, they put them on the bench and in a, in a great big 
device, you know, and then they walk over and they get down. And they're like, and they fire one shot. The flames and they walk make the away. bullet go faster. What's that? The flames make the bullet go faster. Yeah, the flames make the bullet go faster. And then they, they go and they talk for 15 minutes and then they come back and they fire one more shot after their barrel's cool. Because they only fire one shot every 15 minutes because they're afraid their barrel's going to get too hot and it'll affect their accuracy. Yeah. And I don't want to do that. I'm not interested in that. I was well, that's say, well, cool that, that, because that is true. That's not what we do. Yep. That is not what the high elevation precision rifle class is about. However, the, if you're interested in that, what you learn at the high elevation precision rifle course definitely translates and you can use that knowledge because <laughs> that we, we, <laughs> What happens at the, especially the 201 class, well, I mean, especially the 301 class, the advanced high elevation precision rifle, which mm. we'll talk about later, but definitely in the 201 course, which uh, we actually have dates for those for August of 2024. It's an annual experience that we do. And, um, but anyway, so this basic one, what you learn there goes beyond what you need at a competition environment, but what you learn there will definitely help you in that environment if that's your shtick. Yep. And indeed. No, what we're focusing on is we're focusing on teaching the fundamentals of rifle shooting. The the whole purpose of the of the class is to teach you to help you to so that you practice putting one round on target on demand all the time regardless of the conditions. So whether you're kneeling, whether you're sitting, whether you're lying on the ground, whether you're on the bench, whatever, we want you to be able to have the skill and the ability to put a round, one round on target reliably on demand, whether the target is at 100 yards or whether the target is at 500 yards or whether the target is a thousand yards. We want you to be able to, to do that. We're not, we're not shooting machine guns here where we get 20 to 50 rounds to get on target. We have one round to get on target and that, that's what we have. And, uh, Regardless of what, you know, that's, that's something the fundamentals always apply, whether you're hunting or in a competition or just, you know, enjoying yourself where the fundamentals are the fundamentals are the fundamentals. You, you need to apply those regardless of what you're doing. You know, Marine Corps snipers are applying the brass F fundamentals of marksmanship, just like whether, you know, three gunners or hunters or whatever, or I hope hunters are applying the fundamentals of mark, marksmanship. Uh, and additionally, in addition to that, what we want you to come away with when you leave is a, a solid understanding of, of your rifle and your ammo and your scopes and the capabilities of what you've got. We, we make you use it in various conditions and, and, and situations so that by the time you leave, you know that gun, you know, uh, and you know that you know its capabilities and potentially its weaknesses. Weaknesses generally are just mechanical, although sometimes, and this has happened, and this is part of training. This is why we train. We train so that if we're going to have an issue with whatever, with a scope or with a piece of equipment or an accessory or with the ammo or whatever, uh, if we're going to have an issue with it, we want to have that issue in training, not in the real world. Uh, and some people do show up, you know, they go to the, they go to their local gun store or they go to the, the big store, you know, whatever the big box store for guns are. And uh, they tell the guy behind the counter, Hey, this is what I'm going to do, man. And he's like, Oh, this is what you need. You need this. And so they listen to the guy behind the counter and they buy what he recommended. Then they come out to us and they're an hour into shooting and they realize this does not work the way that guy said it was going to work. It seemed like a good idea on paper. You know, when I was standing in the gun shop, it seemed like a good idea. But now that I'm laying on the range looking at targets um, and everybody else around me is hitting the targets and I'm not hitting the targets, that's probably wasn't as good of an idea as I thought. Uh, or that that discount $229 scope on sale for $199, you know, like what a deal, man. That is an awesome deal. And then you get out on the range and you're like, oh, this thing won't hold zero. <laughs> Every time I dial up and then I dial back, I lose my zero. That's not good. 
<laughs> that's a non-starter right there, buddy. So you you learn a tremendous amount at this class. That and that is what training is for, ladies and gentlemen. It is to learn about your own capabilities, your strengths, your weaknesses, areas for improvement, how you can improve, and uh, this and the same thing goes with your gear. You you will know for a fact. You know, some people will leave there and they're like, man, like a great example, Jared, you know, the, the rifle that you used this week, would, do you feel like you have supreme confidence in that rifle? Oh yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, you would yeah, be that able sucker's to like a laser beam. hit a target on demand, you know, one, one shot on demand when you, as need far to. as that bullet will go, I'll hit that target. Yep. Yeah. So, yep. and we're, we're going to get I into that. a prairie dog, which is a Coke bottle size at 500 yards. So there's that. <laughs> yes. I, I didn't hear about that. Oh yeah. So it was the first morning of the first, uh, the first day we were working, uh, we were working out, get, getting everybody's dope one, two, three, four, five, and so forth. And, uh, there was a prairie dog on the ground underneath one of the targets. And I said, Jared, aim at the prairie dog. And, uh, he pressed the trigger and that thing just went, <laughs> I mean, it didn't like fall over. It it disintegrated. <laughs> it came apart. You're like, oh, that's terrible. It's a rat. Get over yourself. It's a rat. It's, it's a varmint that needs to be managed, especially in uh, farm country in where West. you've got cattle yeah. walking around. Yep, uh, I was about to say because it's, it's not just the fact that they're dirty, disgusting, uh, disease carrying animals. They also like digging big ass holes where, yeah, there's a space in between those words. Where, your, where, your, <laughs> where the, your, your bull steps in it and snaps its leg over and then you have to put it down. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it, cause it can't, cause it can't get to the water source and it's going to die anyway. So let's just so, uh, instead. Yeah. Any user. Uh, so that's that. Did we already do all the intro stuff? Uh, we did the official intro. We haven't done like any segments or anything. Oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. So, uh, for, for, <laughs> we're, and we're going to talk more about that as we progress for, for fans of high point firearms. What day is today? today so is it's going to be the 9th of okay. August. We're actually recording it live on the 8th. It goes, it goes out to the world the morning of the 9th. So, so something if, is if, coming. If, yeah, so uh, they've been teasing you. The, the guys over at High Point, if you follow their socialist media, they're doing the they're doing the the Bob FM thing. Something big is coming, he, and something, something big was coming with Bob. Good FM. is coming. Do I'm not be afraid. Something good is coming uh, on August fourteenth. So eight fourteen twenty three. Something big is coming, and uh, well, it is. And, and we're part of that, and so pay attention. We can't tell you exactly. Now, the people who know, the ones who have been listening and paying attention are like, okay. Yeah, we, yeah, we get it. We, I, oh, I get it. We know we what it is. You, if you've been pay, paying attention to the industry, you know what it is. Yeah, you know what it is. But I can't officially say it. I can't say it out loud. Frog Lube, make your precision rifle extreme. Yes, indeed. So, uh, Jared, the rifle that Jared used. We'll go ahead and talk about it right now. Uh, I actually reviewed it. I wrote an article about it last year, or was it two years ago? Uh, I cannot remember. Two years ago. Was it two years ago? It was right when like, we first got it. So it's a, uh, it, is, it is a custom build, and it was built by uh, our friend Ben over at Top Gun Precision in Missouri, in Miss Our Eye. Uh, and Here's I, what I, I know I told him, I, I said, show me. Yeah. He was telling me how great his rifle builds are. And I said, show me. So he did, uh, it's chambered in six millimeter Creedmoor. And, uh, I was able to, uh, when I was, I got to the range and, and on the, like the second day, I guess the first time we, we shot it. Oh, uh, the first time we shot it, we got, it, it was brand new. And then somebody showed up for, two years ago to one of our Hepper classes and their gun went down. So we loaned them that one um, because we're righteous dudes like that. And uh, that's not going to happen anymore. <laughs> 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 no, but we, we actually have a dedicated loaner rifle now 
Uh, we've got a dedicated loaner rifle. So if somebody's rifle goes down, we have a dedicated loaner, a bolt gun that we can hand them and say, here you go, shoot this. Um, but uh, the second time that I went to the range, I, I dialed it out and I was able to, to get it dialed out to 1400. I was using my Black Hills ammo and I was clanging that thing at, at 14. Uh, and so what we did this time before, you're like, what's that new frog lube? Well, before we started the class, uh, before Jared started the class, I just squirted some uh, frog lube, uh, what you call it, the uh, solvent down the barrel, tipped it upside down, squirted it from the chamber to the barrel, let it all drip out. And uh, You mean you didn't let it sit there for 25 minutes? Well, the thing is with frog lube is it's not going to destroy yeah. your rifling, rifling yeah. like other products Some will. Things. Uh, and then I uh, I cleaned off the bolt with the with the solvent, and I started from a, with a basically a fresh clean bolt, and I put frog lube on it. And Jared ran it. So Jared, how often did you? Uh, this is probably a a a good point. How often during the precision rifle class did you disassemble or pull out your bolt, punch the bore, and clean your rifle? Zero. No, no, my friend who does. Bench rest told me that you have to punch the bore every five rounds. Yeah, you don't. Uh, I didn't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to to clean the the no. barrel out every five rounds. To be fair, oh. at a thousand yards, I was shooting steel and not making keyhole groups. So nobody makes maybe, keyhole groups yeah. at a thousand. It maybe if I, if I punch the bore every five rounds, I make a keyhole group at thousand yards. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, start with a clean gun, lube it, lube the bolt up. You don't need to lube the barrel, but lube the bolt up. And it, the, I'm, I'm assuming the bolt ran fine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was funny because I laid behind the rifle and I was like, mm, that's, uh, that smells good. Uh, yeah, that, and see, that's the great thing. That's how you know whether or not, um, yeah, I've got more than one gun. I own more than one gun. And, and, uh, uh -uh. and so... Uh, recently i like i disassemble it and i pull out the action of the bolt or whatever and i put up my nose and i'm like frog lube or nope not frog lube <laughs> and that's speaking of which jared I, I just had a thought about that gun name? no so um i noticed that the bolt handle was a little bit loose so i hand tightened it before you started, did you notice that? No, I didn't even notice. Yeah, so uh, our friend Ben, who has that rifle in his hands right now, send him a message okay. and say, Ben, please check bolt knob Loctite. Because I didn't want to put a tool on it because it's smooth, and if you put a tool on it and you mess it up, then it's no good. So send him that message. Check bolt knob slash loctite titan there you go so I, i'm assuming jared that you will tell me that the the action ran smooth like butter the whole time yeah it but, ran smooth the entire time and and if you guys don't if you've never run bolt guns uh especially precision bolt guns uh generally they're a little bit tight and they're supposed to be they're you know from when they're brand new when that when a gun is brand new the bolt is going to be a little bit tight uh, but then as you now, if it's a custom gun and you and you pay somebody a lot of money, what they'll do is they'll hand lap it and polish it so that when you open that bolt, it just like, like uh, from the beginning. Yeah, if you invert the rifle, if you point the barrel at the sky and you open it, just pull it open with your fingers, let it go. It'll slide right out. It'll, it'll go right back down. That is should it should be nice and smooth. Uh, all the all the good precision bolt guns that I have, like the M40 and the M24, their actions are smooth like glass. And uh, frog lube doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to frog lube your guns. So there you go. Oh, did you see the shirt I'm wearing? Oh, yeah. I'm wearing my juicy, my juicy shirt. And I yeah, wore it on purpose to, rem to remind myself because we had a, a gentleman called in and left us a message and reminded us that we might have neglected our duties as hosts uh, to tell you 
that you can go to Juxy.com and you can watch all of our videos for free. Yeah, you don't even it's, have to create it's an not account, a subscri right? It's not a subscription. You don't have to download an app. You don't have to create an account. You can literally go right now, this second, to j studentofthegun.com slash juxy j u x d z i uh and it'll take you directly to the student of the gun channel yeah. and you can watch the videos the videos are, are crystal clear uh they're they're not they're not google they're not youtube it's 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 a different platform so no you do not for to use juxy you don't have to subscribe you don't have to download an app and you don't have to pay and you if you're an end user Huh? I wish I could play the voicemail from that dude because yeah. I love listening to when he calls and leaves voicemails. They're always yeah. entertaining to listen to. Unfortunately, can I can't absolutely play because not. Yeah, <laughs> we, we can not. Not and family plus, friendly. Yeah. Plus, we don't have permission to, to use his stuff publicly. But um, so there we go. That is that is my pimp, my pimp and my plug in uh, for the Juxy channel. It is available to the public right now. You don't have to download an app. You do not have to subscribe. You don't have to pay. You can watch all of our videos right now. Uh, and uh, that's what you should do. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you did do that and uh, support JUX6i. We've got to support them. You know, people are always like, ah, Google sucks and YouTube sucks and, and, and Facebook sucks. We know. We know they suck. We get it. But the thing is, unless we're willing to support platforms that are not Google and not YouTube and not Facebook, you know, people come up with these alternate platforms and then we don't support them. How in the hell are they supposed to say solvent? Because believe it or not, you don't create something like this for free. It's a lot of money investment. It's a lot of time investment. And they did this because they are not censoring people for being gun lovers. They're not censoring people for speaking the truth. And if we want to have the truth, and if we want to have access to information that YouTube doesn't want us to have, that, that, that freaking lizard person Zuckerberg doesn't want us to have, then we've got to support them. We can't just complain and say, oh, man, uh, Insta garbage and fascist book, they're censoring me. Oh man, YouTube is censoring. Yeah, no kidding. We know that. So right now we've only got a couple of thousand people subscribed to our Juxy channel. That's bull crap. Every single person listening right now should go to Juxy.com, J-U-X-X-I, and subscribe because all of you out there are part of the, hey, we hate censorship. Okay, if you hate censorship, you need to support a platform that doesn't censor. Otherwise, they're going to go away and you're going to be right back there stuck with the censors. It's up to you. All right. Uh, this is the time when I say, listen louder, man. Pay attention. Attention, new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. All right, bada bing, bada boom, bada boom, ba 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 ba. Yes, indeed. I don't mean I don't mean to be stern, but I do need I do mean to be stern. You know, in our industry, in our community, the gun community, we love to complain to each other about how oh man, YouTube is censoring this guy, and YouTube is censoring that guy, and you you're not allowed to 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 show how to disassemble and reassemble a gun on YouTube because because they say you're manufacturing guns. Well, first of all, manufacturing and making and building guns is not illegal. It's not immoral and it's not pornography. So who gave them the authority? Who told them that it was okay to censor that? And so we get mad about it. And then a couple of people say, all right, 
you guys are all angry at YouTube for being censors. You're all angry at Facebook and, and Google and so forth and Insta garbage. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a platform for the gun community that doesn't censor. They do it. And then people snore. They're like, eh, I'm already, I already have YouTube on my phone. Here. I don't want another one. It's like every single person who is in the 2A community should be on Juxy right now. Every single person who's in the 2A community is on should be on Juxy right now. And and I'm sick and freaking tired of people in our culture or our community complaining and then not doing anything about it. Because somebody did do something about it. Some people did do something about it. They invested a million dollars to create, or more, to create J-U-X-X-I, a platform for firearms people where they won't be censored. And yet we still have people in the firearms community that are not there, that are not using it. Well, I'm already using Facebook, and, and they, haven't, they haven't shut me down yet. Oh, oh, we have a YouTube channel. And they haven't shut us down yet, but we have to be really careful about what we post on YouTube because we post this. Or so you're self-censoring. So you're self-censoring. So you you are literally like an abused spouse. You are like a victim of domestic violence. That's what that's what domestic violence victims do. They self-censor. They're like, well, I don't want to get another beating, so. I'll make sure that I don't do this and don't say that and don't, you know. It's control. I actually have an entire, I have an entire, like, masterclass speech about the dangers of social media censorship and, what it, and the conditioning, what it does to you, what it does to you mentally. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. What I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about long-range rifle scopes during our Brownells bullet point segment. All right, bada bing, bada boom, a Brownells dad gal. Now, I don't know how much longer this is going to last. So this is, this is my caveat before I turn the microphone over to Jared. I told you guys last week that uh, Brownells because it's summertime and nobody's buying guns, everybody's out like with their freaking fishing boats or bass boats or whatever, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, so they're like, hey, how do we, how do we gin up sales? How do we get people? So they put a freaking redonkulous sale on right now. And the scope that Jared is going to about to talk about uh, is, is $300 off, not 30%, not 20%, not 10%. Uh, it was nine ninety nine, and it was worth it for nine ninety nine. But now it is six ninety nine, and we're talking about. And you say, "Oh, I don't. I would never spend that much for a scope." You know why you would never spend that much for a scope? Because you don't know how to shoot long range. Um, people ask. I mean, a long, 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 long time ago, I was talking to somebody that that shoots rifles, you know, for a living. Uh, and I, and I said, you know, what, what is your, you know, what is your, uh, your glass budget? And he's like, look, if you're serious about shooting targets at distance, you need to spend about as much money on the scope as you did on the rifle. Not Maybe anymore. 70. <laughs> yeah. We're right now. So hey, yeah, that's flipped around. So I don't know how much longer this is going to last. Like I said, I don't know how much longer the sale is going to last. So you need to, if, if you're interested, do it. Cause I don't want to hear any crying or whining, you know, in a week or two. And you're like, Oh man, you told me that those were on sale. And then I went there and then they weren't anymore. Or they were out of stock. That's your fault, man. That's a you problem. That's not a me problem. Cause I got mine or Jared has his or whatever. So now Jared spent the entire uh, weekend. Jared actually participated in the class as a student. And he spent the entire weekend shooting a rifle uh, with the Brownells MPO. That stands for match precision optic. 
Uh, and it's a three by 18 by 50 millimeter with a 34 millimeter tube. Uh, and do I need to tell you what that means? So the elevation adjustment is 40. 40. Uh, and the wind is just 35, but that doesn't really matter because once we set our wind, we just leave it there and we don't mess with it ever again. Uh, and, and Jared, your scope had, you, the, your windage knob was covered, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 It had a cap on it because when yeah. we're, you don't need to dope for wind when we're, yeah, doing, you, when we're doing you, you don't ever want to worry that your windage knob got knocked off. And that does happen. Sometimes people, people get on there and, and I've, I had to do that the other day. I said, Hey man, what is going on? All your shots are consistently right. Um, check your windage knob, make sure it's zero properly. Mm -hmm. um, so I will be quiet now. And Jared, I want to let Jared give you his feelings or uh, his thoughts on the MPO scope. Uh, it's an amazing scope, especially for the price. Well, first of all, I was able to dial out the dope to 1400 yards. Uh, because that's a 34 millimeter tube on there. So that gives you a little bit more adjustment. And uh, man, I, there's just so many things about this scope that I really enjoyed. I don't have like, I'm not an expert at scopes, but I do have quite a bit of experience and actually utilizing the things, right? So this scope with the um, the turrets, they're difficult enough to move that they won't get bumped and they ov they obviously have the caps too but i ran without caps on the uh on the um the elevation knob and then the uh man i just lost the hang on you you you're confusing the audience you said you ran without caps yeah i didn't put the the caps on the scope so the okay. windage knob had a cap on it yeah no, and the, wind, the, the windage knob, knob yeah you there is no cap for the windage knob or the elevation knob that doesn't exist. Yes. Yeah. So, um, what, what was I going to say? I was getting at something here and I confused myself by going <laughs> off track, but anyway, so they're difficult enough to move that, um, and they did, they don't have caps because they don't exist. It has but a, the point of that positive, was saying that it has, they didn't have caps on increments. them yeah. so that the, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that the knob is difficult enough to move that it didn't matter that it didn't have a cap on it because it didn't get bumped. And we did a lot of moving and shooting from different positions and, and whatnot. So it was difficult enough to move that it didn't get bumped and, and throw me off there, but it's easy enough to move. And the clicks, when you're actually turning the knob, the clicks are, they, they're heavy enough to indicate from even when you're like super focused or you're under time and you've got a little bit of stress there, you know that it's clicking. There's another rifle that I used there where the scope is a, a different scope. It's still a great scope. I was able to, to hit out to 700 with a, what was it? Four power or something. Five power One, it was a one point. It was a 1.5 to five. 1 1.5 to five. So I don't even know what power I was at on that thing, but it doesn't really matter. So I was able to hit out to 700 with that, but moving the knobs on that, it was kind of difficult for me to tell Okay, did that thing actually just click? Well, that wasn't the case with this Brownells MPO uh, scope here. And one of the the reticle in the scope, the reticle that they put in there is freaking amazing. And I think that that's part of the reason why, you know, obviously I had to apply the fundamentals perfectly to be able to, you know, hit out to 1400 yards with this thing. But um, that reticle that's in there is a big reason that I was as successful as I was during the class because it had like a it had a little dot in the middle and it's got this broken and you can go look at pictures of it on the on brownells.com but it had basically a square frame around the dot so all you really had to do was frame the target that you were shooting at in that square and when i hit that prairie dog at 500 it's a really small target which is makes it great for being able to frame it in that reticle so i just literally framed that square around the prairie dog and and then i applied the fundamentals properly pulled the trigger and it it eviscerated the prairie dog which speaks to the accuracy of the firearm as long as the human is applying the fundamentals correctly um what else man what there were so many oh it it had a uh did it come with 
the sunshade or is yes. that an yes it comes so with the four inch sun- with that yeah it comes That's with the four inch sunshade um the, and the sunshade does two things for you uh it yeah. uh it blocks it, it, the sun. It, yeah, well, it, it, you know, if the sun isn't, you know, with, if you're looking through a scope and the sun moves and it's and it's in the just the right, you can get, uh, you can get like sun flare uh, in in your scope. Uh, but also from the other, well, I'm not going to say that this is a sniper scope. I won't say that out loud. Um, but also if, if someone is, uh, well, we'll just keep that part to ourselves. But the the increments. Let's talk about the increments. Is it an MOA scope? Is it a half MOA, uh, quarter MOA? MOA? It's M-rad. a it's a MRAD mil radian. Uh, and so, what does that mean? It means that you've get uh, a one click value is point one mils or point one MRADs. And what that means is, do you want me to get into the math? <laughs> well, it's what it, it's it, the the thing is. Um, it's kind of like the metric system. <laughs> it's kind of like the metric system I where everything is broken into tens. Uh, but it's also weird because it's also every, it's 360. So one mil, which is 10 clicks, which, so a mil is, is 10 micro mils or centimils or <laughs> it's 10 centimils, right? Uh, and you're like that. They're like, that's not the correct verbiage. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, so calm down. That's why I said it. That's all right. Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. So it, it's uh, if if you go ten clicks uh, at hundred yards, it moves your impact three point six inches, right? Uh, with a quarter MOSA scope, if you go, you know, four, it moves you one inch. Then if you go two, it moves you two inches, or eight, you go three inches, and then twelve is three. Right. So in order to move three inches with a quarter MOA scope, you need to go 12 clicks. Right. In order to go 3.6 inches, you need to go 14 clicks. Right. Approximately 14 clicks. Um, so you actually get the and, and the reason that like the, this a 40 M you got 40 mils or 40 M rad of adjustment, which is a lot. And we talked about this before uh, on the show. There are companies out there that are marketing scopes and they're calling them long range scopes, right? And then you uh, realize if you do the math or if you, you just screw up, if you just trust them at their word, uh, like somebody I know did, uh, and then you get it, you put it on your scope and you start dialing out and you dial out to four and five and six and you're happy. You dial to seven, you're happy. You try, you dial to eight and you're topped out. You're like, and you got no more elevation adjustment. You're like, what? How do you call something a long range scope and it won't dial beyond 800 yards? That's not long range, homeboy. Uh, long range is five, eight, a thousand, fourteen mile. That's long range. Okay, 500 yards is median. Long range starts after five. Uh, at least in the West. I know you're in the East. You're like, dude, my range has a 200 yard berm. That's as far as I can shoot. Okay. I know you live in Pennsylvania, Ohio, whatever. And that's as far as you can shoot. Uh, but West of the Mississippi where the country opens up, and <laughs> we open up out here. Uh, Wyoming is the home of riflemen. Okay. Wyoming is rifle country. And out here, people take their rifles seriously. They take them seriously, and they take them so seriously is that they 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 get bored with thousand yard shots. They're like, nah, it's too easy. Yeah. So they, they got so to the point where they they remove the steel targets from two hundred yards because it's too three, easy to hit it. Yeah, they took the three fifty down because it's too easy. Uh, they do things like they put a clover leaf target that is that is ten inches across, like your your at a thousand are. at a thousand yards. And congratulations to Kevin Hammond. Kevin Hammond shot that with his 6.5 Creedmoor. Is that 10 that inches? Was, I don't think that's 10 inches, is it? No, your hand's not 10 inches. No, I mean the clover, because the clover was smaller than my hand. Oh, was it about the size of your hand? Yeah. So if you open the palm of your hand, that was yeah, about the size of the, of the... Oh, yeah. oh, that's right, because you went down and painted them. All right, yeah. So the clover leaf is about the size of an open palm hand. Yeah. And, and uh, Hammond shot that with his 6.5 uh, the first year. Yeah. 
He was one other thing I want to make sure I mention about this MPO scope mm -hmm. is that um, it's the first scope that's first focal point scope. And what that means is that when you when you dial in the magnification, it, the reticle also gets yeah. bigger. Right. And it's the first one that was a first focal plane scope that I actually enjoyed because most of the time I feel like, and this is probably just my, my emotional feeling, but I feel like if the reticle is not broken in the center and it's not set up like this MPO scope, then when you have a first focal plane scope and you m extend the magnification out, then that just gets in your way. I don't yep. like it. And but this one I really did because it had that broken um, square around the center. So I didn't. I I did most of my shooting at six power, um, out to a thousand yards. I was shooting six, but then we did some drills where we were we were spotting for other people, and then we had to find some hidden targets. So I would bump up the magnification all the way. I did it all the way up to as far as it would go, up to eighteen, um, and the reticle did not get in the way. I didn't feel like it was getting in the way for me. So that was a big deal. Yeah. If you've, if you've let you say, what's the deal with these uh, people with quote broken reticles, you know, why, why is there a, why would you want why, a broken reticle? Yeah. Why, why, why don't you, fix why, it? Is it, why is it in the middle? Why is there a broken spot in the middle? That's because when you're shooting precision, you actually want to be able to see the, the impact point. Like if, if you're zeroing that at a hundred yards, um, you can see the, the X ring in the bullseye, right? You actually put the broken bot over the X ring in the bullseye. Oh, uh, so it's the long story short is, is what you want for long range shooting is you need a scope that has at least a 30 millimeter tube. All right. Because it'll give you greater adjustment. Uh, you want external adjustments. You want external knobs, uh, you want a locking windage knob. You either want a windage knob that locks because they have the ones that you pull out, adjust, and then push the cap in and it locks, it won't turn. Or like this one, they just, you take off the, the, the protective cap, you set your wind, then you put the cap back on and it's good. You're like, yeah, but when I have to change my wind, how do I reach up there and change it? You don't. You don't. That's not how we teach it. That's not what we do. Uh, what we do though, because, and why is that? Why don't we dope wind? Jared. Oh, because wind is changing. It always changes. Because wind or is it changes often. It's it's yes. It's variable. In Wyoming. How often does wind change in Wyoming, Jared? <laughs> oh, every three seconds. <laughs> ask the guys who took uh Stuart and Ian ask the yeah. guys who took the, the first one. Uh the wind they was really playing hell with those guys. Uh and how do you learn how to dope wind? By doing it, by getting out there and doing yeah. it, yeah, yeah. How, yeah that's how you Wyoming learn how to do it. Different than wind in Arkansas, for instance. Yeah, if 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 you can learn how to dope wind in Wyoming, I'm going to say that you can go anywhere else in the world and you'll be good. What are you trying to say that it's really windy in Wyoming? Is that what you're trying to say? And it, like at the Maybe. distance, at 100 yards, the wind might be going from the left to the right. At 500 yards, it would be going from the right to the left. And then at 1,000 yards, it'll be going from the left to the right. And then at the mile, it might be going uh, straight towards you or from the right to the <laughs> left. You're like, what? Uh, so which begs yeah. the question, which one matters most? And that's yeah, something which we wins? talk about in the class. Yeah, exactly. That's something we teach you. We don't want to give all that. All, all the, we don't want to give away the secret sauce here. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is uh, if you want to read the reviews, uh, your peers, your your fellow students, uh, have they've all reviewed this class uh, it is a tremendous opportunity for you guys to to get out and just really learn your equipment and and, and accomplish something you know a, as human beings you know all rifles and shooting and everything aside as human beings what is a recommendation we always have for human growth jared it's to do what challenge yourself well to do something to do something you've never done. Oh yeah. How that's often, you know, when, when you're young, see, that's the great thing about being young. When you're young and you're growing up, you do that all the time. Like every, almost every day, every week, whatever, you're constantly doing something that you've never done before, right? You're having an experience that you've never had it before. Then we get older, we get into our twenties, thirties, forties, fifties. How often 
do you do something do you that you've never done before let's face it it's really not very often we we get into a routine where we just yeah, keep say, doing the same stuff over and over and over and over again humans and really it, like routines yeah so when every everyone who's come to our class has left saying that they did something that they did something that they had never done before in their life whether it was shoot a target at 500 yards uh, we've had people who showed up who said i never shot a rifle beyond 100 yards my local range has a 100 yard range i zeroed it there i sit there and i shoot targets at 100 yards never shot at that or or, or some people said like well I, i've shot out to three or four or five um and you know we and we have the you have the opportunity and this is the last thing i'm going to say about the high elevation well actually i'm not i'm going to i'm going to save it because we're kind of we're actually doing the show while we're doing the show uh but the the scope the long story short is this the the brownells mpo scopes are a tremendous value for the money they're a serious scope and if you you know what whatever if you have a 308 a six creed more a six uh a, a six millimeter or 6.5 prick um that's precision rifle cartridge from hornady um 6.5 millimeter prick uh or if you have a six millimeter arc you have a six millimeter arc the uh we, we learned that that is a solid thousand yard cartridge uh if you have that and, and you really want to get the most out of it then because the trick the trick is is when people buy really cheap scopes and they put them on uh you know you don't want you don't you don't buy a six millimeter or six five creed more or, or a six five prick or whatever and put a cheap scope on it because the cartridge has more capability now than the scope does uh, so spend the money and right now brothers and sisters i'm telling you this deal is not going to last forever but if you get one of these, I, I now remember you got to buy 34 millimeter rings. Yes, you have to have 34 millimeter rings. Uh, buy the rings, get good rings. Uh, we're not, and you're not going to regret it. You're not going to regret it. All right, uh, we need you to. We need your support. Go to studentofthegun.com/slash culture. <laughs> it's too bad that we don't have any kind of music licensing rights. Because if we had music licensing rights, I would have Zach drop like Karma Chameleon or Tumble For You or something like that in there. You're like, and both of you guys are like, what? No idea. Why? Over my head. Karma, 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 karma. <laughs> are, are, we, are we sponsored by Credit Karma or something? No. Oh my gosh. All right. Is there anybody in, in the Discord right now? Yes, a couple people. All right. Discord people, did you get that joke? Did you get that reference? I bet Doug Arnold did. Arnold did. I know Doug Arnold got that reference. Uh, but if you go to studentofthegun.com slash culture, what can you do, Jared? Why would they want to do that? Well, you can go and support the companies that support us. And why is that important? Well, Dad talked about it earlier. If you are tired of uh, being censored, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then it's important to keep your your money and your time in the community in the culture and the companies that support us are in the culture and so if you go to studentofthegun.com slash culture you can go there you can support them and for doing that and because you're a listener of student of the gun there are promo codes down there that you can use and save some some of your own ducats yes so do that so uh as as an example right now on uh, studentofthegun.com slash Doug culture. arnold said boy you know i did yep thank you thank you doug i appreciate that <laughs> defiant munitions my topo maps if you don't have a map of your area uh of operation uh you're gonna i'm just gonna wait until the power goes out and there's a crisis then i'll buy a map mm, actually that's the opposite of correct you should have a map, a physical, holding your hand, paper map of your area of operation before the power goes out, before the grid goes down. Uh, Crossbreed holsters, Brownells. Yes, you can use SOTG at Brownells. Uh, frog lube, 
use SOTG at Frog Loop. So uh, there you go. There you go. Uh, so that's just a, a few of the people. And if you are a business and you're listening to me right now and you'd like to reach a, a psycho customer base, a customer base that is so crazy loyal, you wouldn't even believe it. My, our customer base is so loyal that I've been referred to as a cult leader. <laughs> uh, Steve. So that's that. Now it's time for me to be quiet and let Zachary talk for just a little bit. ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. Whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the pimp hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. Yes, indeed you do. ShopSOTG.com is where you should go every single day. And today, I just want to remind you that uh, we have a relatively new book. In, I think it's the newest book in the store, actually, right? Uh, probably, yeah. Yeah. The Patriot so. Fire Team Operation Guidebook. Yes, indeed. Over on ShopSOTG.com, it is a fantastic compilation of all three of the amazing Patriot Fire Team, uh, well, Patriot Fire Team books. I don't know why I emphasize yep. that. And you can head over there right now. It's one dense tome of knowledge that is perfect if you are looking to, you know, expand your brain on liberty. Dad, take over. No, <laughs> so, no what, we, what we did is we took the, the, the original manual, which is about eight years old at this time, uh, and then the equipment guide and then the mission planner combined them into one big, fat, thick book. It's called the uh, the Patriot Fire Team Operation Guidebook. So it's thousands of words uh, for you guys. And uh, the, the whole purpose behind the Patriot Fire Team is this. It's like, look, we, we can sit around and complain or we can just buy stuff. But buying stuff doesn't help your community. Buying stuff doesn't necessarily help your family. We need to have mutual support. No one should have to... So no one should feel like they're carrying the weight of the world on their own shoulders. You need to spread out the load. Uh, and that's we've lost that as a culture, as an American culture. We've lost that. We don't know how to work with each other anymore. Uh, and I, I believe it, it, whether it's happenstance or whether it's deliberate, it's real. You know, look, look what happened over the, the last three years. We're alone together. No, we're not. We're alone, alone. We're not alone together. There's no such thing as alone together. That's just crap. It's propaganda. You know, people don't know how to work with their neighbors anymore. People have been taught to distrust their neighbors. People need to work with their neighbors. You need to know your neighbors. You're like, well, my neighbor's nosy. Okay, I get that. But uh, we need to work with each other. Because if we're all a bunch of individuals, all right, what the... Going all the way back to 1776, what was the phraseology? United we stand, divided we shall fall. Right? That's 240 plus years ago. We understood that. Like, united we stand, divided we shall fall. And until we, unless we get united and start working with our communities, our neighbors. You know, forget the the, the jackasses in Washington, D.C., and forget the jackasses in your state capitol. Worry about the people that are around you. Spend time working with those people that are around you. You're like, I, but Paul, I'm trying. It's hard. I'm like, yeah, I know. I get it. That's why I wrote a whole doggone book about how to do it. <laughs> Maybe that's why I wrote the book, uh, because it is difficult, and, and you need a plan. And so there's a plan. What? You did that for me. I did it for you. I did. I did it for you. So you're welcome. All right. So uh, now it is time for a student of the gun homeroom brought to you by Crossbreed Holsters. All right, all right, all right. What is the primary theme of the Student of the Gun Homeroom by Crossbreed Holsters? To be what? Dangerous, 
on demand. You need to be DOD. You need to be dangerous on demand. You're like, well, not when I'm at home. I don't need to be, I'm not paranoid like you. I don't think I need to have a gun on me when I'm at home. I don't think I need to have a gun near me when I'm at home because I'm not paranoid like you. Okay, cool. Sorry, bro. Um, do you guys have this story open? Yeah. The, the Fox News dead cab story. So what in the Farfic Nugent does that video on top uh, have to do with the, the story? Uh, it's about a bear. Have you seen that? Yeah. Taking a bubble bath. Yeah. So Fox, you guys like totally HUA. H-U-A. Uh, oh, no. The story is by a chick with a hyphenated last name. What do we know about women with hyphenated last names? Can they be trusted? Unless she is she Latina? Uh, I, I bet it's <laughs> read the name and tell me. You answer that one for yourself. No, she is very white. She's totally a honky. So, but the story is not about a bear taking a bubble bath. This is about a bear home invasion, not B A R E B E A R. So we got a home invasion by a bear kills large black bear found in couple's living room, five feet away. Well, how do you know that the bear didn't take a bubble bath first? It might have. That might have been looking for the bathtub. A Montana couple got an unwelcome visitor when they found a black bear in their living room and took matters into their own hands, shooting and killing the intruder. Stop. So what did I just say about women with hyphenated last names? Can they be trusted? Are they liberals? Read the first sentence. The mindset of the author is right there in the first sentence. What did they do? They did what? what their own hands. Did Thank you, Zachary. Who uses that terminology? Who uses the terminology taking matters into your own hands? How often do we have post-shooting interviews with chiefs and sheriffs and so forth and they say we recommend that people not take matters into their own hands that is a that is a media pejorative that's not an applause they're not saying oh you did a great job no right there took matters into their own hands how about defended yeah, their own a, lives? That's a positive for me. It's like, yeah, good. That's not what you're supposed to do. Uh-huh. You have to understand these people. How many times have we, have we pointed that out? The chief of police in, in, or, the, or the police superintendent in Chicago. Uh, we recommend that people not take matters into their own hands and that they call 911. It's very dangerous to take matters into your own hands. That is a media pejorative, but go on. So Celie Oblander and her fiance, Thomas, Thomas Bolcom, Bolcom, they're awakened at 3 a.m. to one of their two dogs, Maisie, barking ferociously. I'm glad they identified the dog. Yep. I was wondering, like, while which the, dog? While the couple initially brushed off the howling off, figuring a raccoon or a skunk had caught the dog's attention, Bolcom eventually walked downstairs to see what was going on after the dog would not stop making a ruckus. So let's let's dog owners. It says one of their two dogs was barking ferociously. What the frick was the other one doing? That's funny. Yeah, it was the other chilling. one was like the the other one was like it was like shut up. <laughs> oh, how many people here have more than one dog? And how many people have two dogs where one starts it and then the other one chimes in? That, I mean, that, that's the, it's like the one we had that where one would do it. And then the other one was like, oh, well, he's barking. I probably should be barking too. But that, I, just, I just find that funny. It's like, to see, well, the one dog wouldn't, the other one's like, shut up. I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> the one that wasn't barking, 
needs to go because that's a crappy dog. <laughs> so there's a bear in the house and one of the dogs barked. Okay. When Bulkham, a commercial painter and elk hunter, went to investigate and tried to coax the Labrador pit bull mix downstairs, he found a black bear standing in the living room five feet away. Wearing just a t-shirt and underwear, Bulkham ran back downstairs, got a handgun, and returned to the living room where he shot the bear. It ran into the couple's sunroom, so he shot the bear off several more times. I can't, I mean, this dude must have been in like a freaking daze and stupor and, and hasn't trained himself to just take the gun with him in the first place. Because it's 3 a.m., your dog's barking. Like, why would you not He's going go crazy first? Yeah, why would you, you take not the, have a gun dog. with you immediately? Last night... Goki was at the door with the hair standing up on the back of his, his neck. So I grabbed the flashlight and the pistol and we went outside. I'm sure if there was an animal somewhere out there in the yard. Yeah. I, I mean, I, cause he knows he's not an idiot. Oh, uh, but I didn't know if I opened that door, there could have been a mountain lion standing in the, in the front yard. Uh, so I had a gun in my hand, you know, but that's just me. Because you're paranoid. You just think you should have a gun. I know. Oblander. There, there's a lot of things that we can learn here uh, from the situation. Because it's uh, communication is one of them. Because if you think about this, the wife, fiance, is downstairs in the bedroom wondering, you know, what's going on. And the husband runs back down with, with his shirt and underwear on, grabs a gun, and Ideally, you would want to have the consciousness to communicate with her what's going on so that she she knows it's like, OK, it, it's not a human. It's a black bear and he's going to go take care of this. But I should probably also just in case, you know, have have something to protect myself in case that bear gets down here. So uh, um, you're just practicing you communication techniques guns. so that you you've established that. Uh, mind body connection before you actually need it is a uh, an important thing to do yeah uh, the uh here's what you don't do don't read the comments of this don't story read the com yeah yeah i'm not gonna oh. do that yeah don't Oblander do that. praised her soon-to-be husband for his quick reaction saying that he did a great job uh she said quote i never thought there would be a bear in the house so that was quite a wake-up call at three in the morning I just stayed downstairs with the dogs trying to help keep them out of the way and let Tom handle it. He did a great job. Uh, with a dead bear in the house and a trail of blood around the house, the couple called the fathers, their fathers and Bolcom's brothers. The group carried the massive Bruin <laughs> out <laughs> into the couple's yard in rural Luther, Montana. A local woman Luther told them the bear was about 10 years old and 250 to 300 pounds. Yeah, that's a big one. So what, 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 where were they at, Zach? Montana. 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 <laughs> I cannot, I don't, I don't even remember which episode that was or where that came from, but I cannot see or hear and not think of Eric Cartman saying that. Funny thing, Montana. I had a dream about Eric Cartman last night. Or they had Eric Cartman. You had a dream about Eric Cartman? Uh, or about Montana? No, about Eric Cartman. He caused a zombie apocalypse. Meant, yeah. Oh. So where is Luther? Luther, Montana. I'm looking it up on the mappage. Uh, it looks like. where It's uh, my mappage is being stupid. Looks Dave. like it's 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 north of Yellowstone. Yeah. Well, why was their window open anyway? Why don't they just run their AC? Yeah, because you don't run AC in the north. That's why. They it's actually a, it looks Luther like is actually cabin. I would debate. Yeah, that. it's it's on the the edge, the northern edge of the Custer National Forest, the Custer Gallon National Forest. So if you guys are y'all are wondering, y'all's wondering where that is. That's where it is. If you're looking for a cabin in Luther, um, oh, let's see. Uh, so Rocky Oberlander, who I'm assuming is the dad. So we we've so, got. At least nobody got hurt. It's just yep. too sad because it was a beautiful bear. Yeah. Well, it still can be. Yeah, that's true. If you got a, like a no kidding taxidermist there in town. Uh, oh, no. 
Do we have a statement from from the Bambi police? Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Park spokesperson Chrissy Webb said that the warden did, uh, said that the warden determined the shooting was justified in self defense. The large beast had snuck through the couple's screen window and made himself comfortable. Uh, this is pretty ab- so. Webb said this is pretty abnormal behavior to be to have a bear entering a home. This large male black bear ended up dying because of improperly stored attractants in the community. What? What? Did this biatch just say? The wow. Bambi police said the large bear died because of improperly stored attractants. Here we go. There it is. The Bambi police are all socialist a-holes. It's the people's fault. It's not the bear's fault. We're victim shaming again. It's the victim's fault. They were a... What? We're not talking about, tr- we're not, I didn't say, no one said that uh, that homeboy heard some noise outside where the bear had knocked over the trash cans and he ran outside into the driveway and killed the bear, okay? Nobody said that. So we're supposed to put our food in our homes in bear-proof containers inside of our houses now? Go fornicate yourself christy you socialist a-hole what is it about people who go into this line of work that their mindset is this woke socialist crap no this is the way it's supposed to work chrissy let me tell you how it's supposed to work animals are supposed to smell humans and think i don't want to go there animals in a normal situation smell humans and go the other way jared hunting have you ever been hunting yeah what is one of the things you need to if you want to successfully take a game animal whether it's whatever hogs deers whatever deer whatever what do you have to pay attention to what we have is what we have in wyoming right Mm -hmm. the wind why because if they smell you then they're gone it's not it's not a good thing yeah right right if they you know deer hunters what's what's what what do you have to make sure you you know deer all all experienced hunters are like they the first thing they do is they gauge the wind if the wind's at my back i'm not gonna see anything you know hogs hogs sense of smell rivals a bloodhound they, they rival that of tracking dogs they have a tremendous sense of smell that's why they can find truffles man uh so if you're going after hogs you got to mind the wind you have to check the wind because if the wind's at your back they're going to smell you way before they see you and they're going to smell you way before you see them and they're going to be gone Poof. why is that because their natural instinct is <laughs> I smell something that's not right. It's not natural. It's not part of this forest. It's foreign. And that's man. So I'm going to leave and go the other way. So when you have an animal that smells men, you think, do you think maybe that the scent of the humans was in this cabin? Do you think maybe the bear smelled the human scent? improperly stored attractants go fornicate yourself and the messed up thing about this uh is uh i bet you nobody censored or or uh, not censored uh censured this chrissy webb person maybe they did i don't know i would hope that she, I know she's got a boss somewhere. I would hope that after she went out and said this, that her boss called her in the office and said, what did you just tell people? That it's their fault? The truth, the truth about guns has uh, the full quote from Chrissy, and she said she wasn't talking about the homeowners. She said... The truth about guns has a detailed one on this? Yeah. I did not uh, know that. Yeah, I just found it because I... Google that chick's name. 
to f- see what if she had a history of this kind of stuff. Uh, it says the this, uh, no black bears frequent the area, and in recent weeks, one had been prowling the neighborhood, getting food from unsecured garbage cans and other sources. Webb said, although the house that was broken into did not have unsecured food or garbage, Webb said that the bear likely became habituated to associate humans with food, creating a dangerous situations for local residents and the animal, which is uh, probably true, but. If well, a bear sees a human and it associates a human with food, I mean, they're probably going to eat you. Well, you, here's the thing. Can I tell you, can I speak some truth? Wild animals used to be afraid of humans. Yeah. Why were wild animals afraid of humans? Because humans hunted them. And they're like, mm, those things hunt us. We should go the other way. And what, are we, what have we done? This is not going to stop. I don't care what Mr. Pogue says. This is not going to stop. It couldn't have been long enough in the like human, or, I mean, animal DNA at this point for them to like change that. Could it have? I mean, it, it's since hunting, I, I haven't actually looked at this, so I don't know for sure. But um, thinking about it, it's like we, the change in the amount of people hunting has been decreasing for how long do you think? It's been on a downward slope for 50 years. Yeah. So 50 years, I don't think 50 years is enough time for animals to like realize in their, in their DNA to be changed so that they're not afraid well, of humans. Here's the, here's because the, they're not being hunted. Here's the truth that I will speak to you. There are two types of animals in, in the, in the world. There's predators and there's prey. Yeah. Right. The Bambi police will tell you that a bear is not a predator. A bear is a predator because an animal that'll smell that smells a human and deliberately goes to that smell, they're doing that because they feel, you know, they're inside of their brain housing group. They're the alpha, they're the predator. Mountain lions do that, grizzly bears do that, wolves do that. They're all predators. And so, what we're what they won't address what these bambi police people will never address and admit bears are just curious creatures who eat nuts and berries and sometimes picnic baskets that's all they want is your picnic basket and they eat nuts and berries no bears are omnivores they eat anything that will go into their mouth including people and dogs and you know They eat nuts and berries, yeah, but they also eat meat. Bears are not herbivores. Nick brought up a good point. He said 50 years is 50 generations for animals or so. Yeah. So think about where humans were 50 generations ago. I'm like, okay, fair. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like these bears lives for 75 years. Right, yeah. Um, Have you seen that video of the bear holding the salmon in the river and, like, pulling its skin off with its teeth? Brutal. That's because bears are herbivores. They eat nuts and berries. No, bears eat meat. Look at their teeth. Bears eat whatever they want. Bears eat. Bears are omnivores. They eat anything that they can fit in their mouth. Uh, and bears are predators. Oh, also here's a here, here's a fun thing. Uh, on Joe Rogan, they were talking about like talking to a survivor guy about like eating bear meat, and apparently there's one. Uh, just quick side tangent. There's one area of the United States where there's like a lot of wild blueberries, and the guy went and killed a bear there. And apparently, the bear was eating like 75 percent blueberries of its in its diet. And apparently, the meat was kind of like had a purple tinge to it and was sweeter than it should have been. Yeah, and apparently, it was good. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. People eat bear. You're like eat bear. Yeah, people eat bear. Um, if you're starving. You don't leave anything for the wolves. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but uh, I can't imagine the bears like, oh, free One blueberries. Person got that reference. I'll shut up now. No, that uh, yeah, this this is crazy. And the reason we bring this up is a to debunk this this hippie crap garbage about you don't need to carry a gun in the wild. You're more likely to shoot yourself with your gun than to ever use it for self defense. The people who a chance is what you're saying. People so you're hold that there's them, a chance. 
hold themselves up as these experts like that that freaking tool bag mr pogue the wildlife outdoor expert and he wrote an article on outdoordouchebags.com and it's out there in the world and then the thing is people will read that and they're like well this guy's a wildlife expert he's an outdoor expert and he said that he's been going to the woods for 30 years and never once needed a gun and so what what happens good people get talked out of doing the right thing should we or should we not take the advice of the galactically stupid there we go all right so that's that mr that's that the uh student of the gun homeroom brought to you by crossbreed holsters is all about being dangerous on demand like when the dog is going ape crazy at 3 a.m dude if i woke up out of a out of a dead sleep at 3 a.m because the dog was going ape crazy i would have a pistol and a flashlight in my hand you know uh but that's it, just me especially you're like oh i you know I thought it was a skunk or a raccoon. Let me tell you what, if there's a skunk or a raccoon inside of my house, well, right, no, I thought it was outside. Uh, if you got chickens, the raccoons need to go bye-bye. They need to go live somewhere else. That's, that's, I'm just letting you know. All right. So, uh, what did we not talk about yet in regards to the high elevation, the advanced high elevation precision rifle class? Well, there's a lot of stuff that we didn't talk about as far as specific things that I learned, at least. This is the first time I've ever went through an advanced. I've been a coach in the, the basic class for a few years now, so I'm very, very familiar with all of that material. Hmm. However, there were a lot of things in this class, and it was one of those where I'm like, I don't even know what, you know, what does advanced even mean because I'm in that unconscious incompetence portion for advanced skills like i've got the fundamentals and i can apply them and one thing that we talked about this weekend is no that you have conscious competence i mean con no 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 for yes for advanced but as far as the things that could be advanced mm -hmm. tactics like i didn't know what they could be right mm -hmm. um but conscious competence in in the application of the skill yes i have that um but as far as the information of what would be used in or taught in the class i had no idea so um one of the things that just blew my mind was 50 and 25 yard dope like that was just like Pow! why would you do and you know after you think about it after you're exposed to it and you think about it for a minute you're like okay that actually makes sense but when i learned it i was like wow that that is the opposite of what i thought it would be and I am very glad that I learned that because that's an, an important skill to have if you're ever put into a position where you've got to use it. Well, it, you, you know, it's like uh, you you have a hundred yard, zero, you have a rifle that has a scope on it, it's zeroed at hundred yards. And let's say you're shooting groundhogs or prairie dogs or varmints or whatever, and and you're you're being quiet and you're minding the wind and and you walk somewhere, you're walking in the woods or whatever. And this, this happened to me 20 years ago or more, um, you know, had the rifle zeroed for a hundred, it was dead on a hundred. I'm like, I'm good. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to shoot, uh, pests, groundhogs in, in the, in the hay fields in the, in the pastures of Ohio. And, uh, you're walking through the woods and you pop, you come out of the woods, you know, nice and quietly, like you're supposed to be. And there's a groundhog 27 yards away. And you're like, well, my rifle zero for 100, and it's way closer than that. I mean, it's, it's 25, 26, 77 yards away. So I don't want to shoot over it, so I need to hold low, right? Need to hold low. I need to hold at the bottom, right now at the top. I need, I need to hold to the bottom of the animal, press the trigger, boom, the dirt kicks up, the, the animal's gone. What? How did I miss? You miss because you didn't know your, you didn't know your freaking rifle mechanics. You didn't understand the mechanics of the rifle. Yeah. You know, if you have an AR-15 with a scope on it, you've got a two and a half inch offset between the bore and the opt in the reticle. Yeah. And that's, it's funny to me because I've done this before in other training classes and you've probably taught it to me as well, uh, like way back in the day. But uh, in a recent training class I took with John Farnham, we did what's called the mother-in-law drill. 
and where you have to save a hostage. And so with a fighting rifle, I, I completely know and comprehend the mechanics of that, but offset. you put the scope Calculate on offset. there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, but you put the scope on there and for some reason it just didn't click until, you know, you taught it and, and I did it. And, uh, but it's the same concept, right? The, the offset is the offset, no matter what, if it's sights or scope or, or a uh, red dot or whatever it is, the, right. the offset is the offset. Um, but the mechanics, like with a, a scope, the MPO scope, you can actually dial. You don't have to do the holdover like you do with a fighting rifle. So, um, you know, like I said, after you know, after I was exposed to the concept and I thought about it for a minute, I was like, okay, you know, I've got this other experience that now I can draw that parallel to. But not going through it ever before was like that is kind of crazy, but it really isn't. It just makes sense. Um, and then there was, let's see there, that one, um, finding targets that are camouflaged is very, very hard. Unknown and distance camouflage yeah, targets. Unknown distance camouflage target in, in, and dad was nice. He said, Hey, you've got a target from the South that is in this general vicinity, go find it. And it was very hard. Now, once we found the targets, we were on them pretty quickly. And I'm very proud of all the students that were there and, and the, my teammates, because once we found the stuff, it was it was over. But the problem is you've got to find it first. Mm. And that was way more challenging than I thought it was going to be. Well, yeah, and that's something that we do. We have uh, we have the basic range has known di- what they call KD, known distance targets. You know, that berm, that target sand is 100 yards. And it's all even increments. It's one, two, three, four, and five. And so we have that. But then we also, I, I put target. There are targets out that are not at even distances. They might be three hundred and thirty-two yards away, or four hundred and seventeen yards away, or you know whatever. Um, and so part of the lesson is not only finding, locating the unknown distance targets, but then once you've located them, you need to estimate the range. And then once you've estimated the range, then you need to find, you need to calculate the correct dope to hit it. Uh, So it's all challenging. Yeah. The range estimation wasn't very difficult because we cover that in the basic class and the high elevation precision rifle 201, that course so the the stu- everybody that and obviously the 201 is a prereq for the 301 so you have to complete the 201 before you can even go to the advanced class and so everybody there had experience with unknown distance targets and and um, range estimation and whatnot so we i was very proud of the people that were like hey the, you know, there were people the some of the students there were way better than me at range estimation and uh like i'm talking within like five yards that's how specific it was and there was no laser range finding from these guys it was just looking at the target and saying hey i think it's that far and uh so i was very proud of them but that like that was finding the target was the most difficult thing and then the second most difficult thing i would say would be range estimation and but then hitting the target was never a problem until you have a tiny tiny target that is uh by a rock that is obscuring the target uh, and by tiny, tiny target, I'm talking like one and a half to 1.75 inches. 1.75 inches. 1.75, yeah, less than two inches and uh, at about 300 yards or so. And it's it's a little bit more difficult than you think it's going to be because you, well, finding it is kind of demoralizing. And then by the time you find it and you get on target, now you're questioning your ability to even do anything in life because you couldn't find it in the first place. And that's one of the benefits of the class is being able to experience that challenge, but then overcome it because then you have that added confidence in not just your ability to master the fundamentals, but your ability to do other things as well. Things that you haven't done before. Yeah. We, every, every single person who came to the class, uh, both the original, but both the, uh, two weeks ago, the, the, the 201 HEPR and then the advanced one we did last week, every one of those people accomplished more than they previously had. They all said that they, they had done things that they had never done. Uh, they made hits that they had never made. Um, the guys who shoot 308 rifles, uh, our, our buddy, Justin, 
uh, brought a 308, but he brought it with a 175 grain boat tail hollow point, which is a good a good load. Uh, it's a good long distance load. And, and a rifle that was built by Ben at Top Gun by Precision. Top Gun Precision. That sucker made it out to 1400 yards. Yep, he got. Uh, we dialed him in. We did a wind with a call. 308. <laughs> yeah, and once he got, uh, uh, once he got his his dope down, he uh, two hits in a row. Bang! I said, do that again. Bang! Did that again. Did he? Was uh, he able to dial to fourteen, or did he have to do holdover? I can't remember because if he was able to dial to fourteen, that would be amazing. That scope was like three hundred, four hundred bucks or something like that. Yeah. So. Um, it's a, he, he was using a fixed 12, a fixed power scope, not an adjustable power scope. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, and you say, all right, hold on, Paul. You can't shoot 1,400 reliably, accurately, consistently with a 308. It can't be done. No, it can't. You're right. It can't be done on the East Coast at sea level. It can't be done at 100 feet above sea level. At 7,300 feet where the air is thin, the atmosphere is thin, it can be done. It can be done. Uh, and you're like, yeah, well. Because we did it. <laughs> what's like, what's the happened. rise and fall of a 308 at 1,400? All right. Insane. At, at 7,300 feet. Now, this, is, this is like fun with math. <laughs> it's like fun with math. At 7,300 feet where we were. From the, the shot, from, from where the shot was made to the impact, the bullet rose 75 feet at its apex and then dropped. So the bullet, it's, you know, everyone's, everyone thinks bullets go straight like laser beams. It was like, well, it's like, uh, at sea level, you know what? At sea level, it's a 95 feet foot apex. It's a wow. 95 foot drop. So a 75 foot drop for those of you that like math is a five story building. Yeah. How many yards was that? 14. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. I didn't so, get to see the bullet trace, but a couple yeah, of I was the class watching day. the bullet trace through the big eye. Wow. It's like and, a mortar. And, and it comes in from the top and you're like, you catch it coming in from the top and then phew, dropping into the target. Um, and that's another thing you get to learn to experience is bullet trace. You're like, what the heck is bullet trace? It's when you see the bullet cutting through the atmosphere. You're like, you can't see a bullet. You can see the trace. You can see the bullet cutting through the atmosphere if you have a magnified optic. So all of these things and more can be yours if you sign up for the Student of the Gun University High Elevation Precision Rifle Class. It is an all-inclusive uh, for your tuition, you get the range fees, the education, the training, you get housing, and you get food. Uh, you get all of that. Your, you just show equipment. up with your stuff. You don't have to worry about hotels, restaurants, packing lunches, nothing. You show so the up, answer is, you get fed and housed. The answer is that he dialed the 1400 with that scope. <laughs> that's awesome. Dude, that scope is a... Who picked that scope out for you? <laughs> Uh, all right. Looks like we're creeping up on 90 minutes here. Uh, this week on Student of the Gun University podcast. What is that? I thought we were listening to that right now. No, the university podcast is a single topic, short form, easy to digest, and it uh, comes out every Thursday morning. And we're going to talk about how much scope is enough and how much is too much. Uh, and that is going to be on the university podcast this week. And unless there's any questions, comments, or concerns, this is the time when I tell you, what do I tell you? Remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. Thanks for staying until the end. Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. And remember, you are a beginner once, a student for life.